Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're really happy to have uh, Professor Norman today uh, here giving us a talk. So Norman is a professor at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University and a faculty member at Scilab. His current research interests include web security, privacy, and commerce. Norman is co-director of the School of Computer Science's PhD program in Computation, Organizations, and Society and director of the school's Mobile Commerce Lab. He's been on the faculty of Carnegie Mellon since 1991 and is also well known for his work in scheduling, constraint satisfaction, and constraint optimization, supply chain management, and the semantic web. In the late 90s, he served as chief scientist and the European Union's $800 million e-work and e-commerce program, which at the time included all pan-European research in cybersecurity and online privacy. He has authored around 180 scientific publications, including several books, and is co-founder of Wombat Security Technologies and uh, Zipano Technologies. Among other awards and honors, Norman is co-recipient of IBM's 2005 Best Academic Privacy Faculty Award. Norman received his PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University, an MSc also in compu computer science from the University of Southern California, and a BS in electrical engineering and applied physics from Brussels Free University. Please join me in welcoming Norman. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I will remember to make my bio shorter so that uh, someone doesn't actually have to uh, go through all that reading process. Uh, I've been asked prior to starting to uh, uh, tell you that the abstract that you may have seen originally uh, posted on the Scilab uh, website is a little different from the one I eventually came up with and that was uh, eventually circulated earlier today. Uh, just in case, you will see that the topics are very similar. So uh, you don't necessarily have to leave if it turns out that you're interested more in the first abstract and didn't see the second one. But uh, I thought I would clarify that. So the question I'd like to address uh, today is, can we somehow reconcile privacy and social networking? Very often, you hear in the press, you see in the press, you hear on, on TV uh, or at conferences that somehow there is this uh, perceived dichotomy between uh, privacy on the one hand and uh, social networking on the other. And people occasionally argue that the success of one might imply the demise of the other. And uh, I thought I would spend some time uh, presenting some research uh, results that suggest that somehow the answer seems to be a bit more complex uh, than that. Uh, but beyond just uh, suggesting that the answer is more complex uh, than that, I would like to also discuss technologies that we've been working on for the past few years that essentially uh, are designed to bridge the gap between uh, those two forces that seem to somehow be pulling us in different uh, directions. And so uh, essentially to sort of uh, repeat what I said, uh, there is this view somehow that you can't argue with success, right? So 600 million Facebook users, uh, you know, they voted with their feet and they've said that, you know, by and large they're relatively satisfied with what Facebook does. And even though some people might think that somehow these practices are not necessarily doing a very good job at preserving people's uh, rights to privacy, somehow hundreds of millions of people have decided that that was not a major concern. And so the conclusion that what might reach from this might be that perhaps after all, you know, society has evolved. Uh, privacy, as you probably know, is a somewhat subjective uh, concept, even though it's a fundamental uh, concept, one that's recognized in the Declaration of Human Rights and obviously recognized in, in our uh, constitutional documents in various forms. Uh, through various acts that have been passed over the past few decades and so on. Um, it's also a subjective uh, topic in the sense that it has a lot to do with how we feel about uh, making our information available under different contexts, seeing that information being shared with different parties subject to different kinds of conditions. And so as uh, information uh, becomes uh, more readily available, as it's easier for information to flow uh, with the emergence of uh, mediums such as the internet, obviously. Uh, we've seen uh, some interesting tensions arise and we've also uh, seen that people and society in general has been confronted with scenarios that perhaps they had not envisioned even just a decade ago. And so that essentially forces us to reevaluate how we feel about these different scenarios and what that means with regard to our sense of privacy, scenarios that we feel comfortable with as well as scenarios that we feel uh, less comfortable with. And so uh, this uh, naive vision that somehow uh, privacy perhaps no longer matters. Even Facebook would not uh, actually try to defend that view. So Mark Zuckerberg himself has uh, essentially 
and he's made lots of statements about privacy, some going in one direction, some going in the opposite direction, but here's one that seems to be uh, going in, the in favor of privacy, so uh, this might have been on the day where perhaps they were facing a major backlash. And so he said things such as the debate about privacy is really about uh, control, and, and that's uh, uh, something that everyone uh, will tend to agree on. That means that it's essentially about whether or not we as individuals have sufficient control over what happens to infor our information. Right? Uh, and by giving people that control, we enable them to share more stuff. And what he's referring to here are the very many different settings that uh, uh, Facebook has made available according to some something like 170 settings. Don't try to count. It's a large number. And uh, despite that somehow, uh, we've also seen that uh, this was not such a long time ago. I actually checked today whether or not this was still the case. You actually have to type the D in delete to get to that. But a few months ago, you didn't have to type the D in delete uh, in Google. And as you know, uh, Google would suggest uh, queries that you might be uh, looking for. I think this is called, what is it called, instant search uh, or something along those lines, right? And so uh, the idea is that it's going to try to guess based on statistics of the most common uh, queries that it has seen what you might be looking for. And so how do I seem to be something that uh, you know would often lead to how do I go about deleting my Facebook account? Suggesting this was a few months ago at a time when there, were, there was a major uh, a backlash with regard to some of uh, Facebook's latest moves in the of privacy, people were potentially looking for deleting their Facebook account, realizing this was not a uh, trivial process to go through. Uh, obviously, as we know, the number of Facebook users continues to grow. And so to somehow uh, use this uh, slide here to sort of declare that uh, the demise of Facebook, I think, would be uh, uh, very naive. This is clearly not what we're seeing, but certainly we've seen some people having problems uh, with the way uh, Facebook was uh, dealing uh, with privacy, the kinds of settings that were being made uh, that were made available to them, feeling that somehow perhaps these uh, settings were not sufficient. Even though there are many of them, uh, offering many settings to users is not necessarily a recipe for success. Yes, in principle, you provide the user a lot of control with a lot of control, but that control may or may not be the right kind of control. That control may be extremely confusing. That control presumes that people will go and tweak all these things properly, uh, which uh, uh, and all these things, as it turns out, happen to be uh, very naive uh, assumptions. And so. The question in many ways is, you know, uh, if, if Facebook offers all these settings, you know, and, and yet uh, people have these concerns still about privacy on Facebook, can we somehow do a better job at understanding what is really going on? And, you know, what are, in fact, those kinds of tensions that seem to be underlying these issues that I've been talking about? And so in order for us to try to better understand uh, those issues, we've been looking in particular over the years at uh, one family of scenarios, and these scenarios are referred to uh, traditionally as location sharing scenarios. And many of you must be familiar with those scenarios, but just in case. Right, so this is a situation where I would be willing to share my location with different people. And I might want to have an application, for instance, one that leverages the GPS and Wi-Fi location tracking on my cell phone to make this location available uh, to different people. Uh, a good example of this application, the one that you've probably most, that you're most likely to have heard of, is called Foursquare. Right, and Foursquare is essentially a check-in location sharing application where essentially when you go to a cool place, you want to let the world know that you've arrived at this cool place and potentially compete for a badge or a discount uh, on your uh, favorite coffee at uh, Starbucks. These are the kinds of scenarios that we've seen there. And those scenarios actually are fairly popular among uh, some people. So uh, Foursquare today claims about 7.5 million users. Uh, in practice, that means that at some point or another, uh, each one of those seven and a half million people have used their service in terms of active user on a day-to-day -day basis. It's probably closer to two or three million uh, people as far as I can tell. And so this is success, but at the same time, it's nowhere near the success that you have on Facebook. Right? So Facebook is 600 million people. Uh, Foursquare is somewhere between a, a couple million and seven and a half million uh, people, depending on how you count. And so that seems to be an interesting uh, set of scenarios to look at because, in effect, even though Foursquare claims success, it's nowhere near the success that you've seen uh, with other social networking scenarios, such as uh, sharing pictures uh, and, and sharing other kinds of uh, information that you see being shared on a regular basis on Facebook. Um, and so we decided to go ahead and study this part of family of uh, sharing uh, scenarios uh, through our own application. So one thing is to say, okay, there are enough applications out there, perhaps we can just collect data based on those applications, but as it turns out, uh, people within this domain, and uh, we, we've seen this, for instance, with Facebook and, and others, uh, will tend to pull the rug under your feet very quickly. 
as you collect more information, perhaps come up with uh, conclusions that are not necessarily very happy with, right? And so we said that we rather have uh, control over the information that we are allowed to collect. And we went through the trouble of actually uh, developing a family of location sharing applications and, uh, and um, running a bunch of different exper experiments to try to better understand one, how people feel about these scenarios, what are the kinds of concerns that they have, and to what extent we can do perhaps a better job than Foursquare at capturing the privacy preferences that they seem to have within those kinds of scenarios. And so, as it turns out, uh, Foursquare, if you think about this for a minute, only captures a very tiny set of location sharing scenarios. Those are the scenarios where you're pretty proud, you want to brag, or you want to invite your friends to come and join you at Starbucks. But lots of other scenarios that are more utility oriented and that will involve coordination, for instance, with other people. Let's say, for instance, I've got a meeting and uh, occasionally I run behind for my meetings. I would actually be quite happy to let everyone who's supposed to meet with me start seeing my location within 10 minutes from the time that meeting is supposed to start so they can see whether I've completely forgotten about the meeting or whether I'm just on my way. Uh, I've got scenarios, for instance, uh, with my wife where we need to coordinate about who's going to go and pick up our kids. We want to make sure that we've arrived at the right place on time. The last thing we want to do is call each other while we're potentially still driving to make it uh, to the right place in time. And so those are other examples of scenarios where it would make sense to be able to share a location without having to call someone. It turns out that if you look at actually phone calls on cell phones, many of the calls, I don't know exactly the, 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 the percentage, but a large or at least a significant percentage of these calls involve the question of where are you? Uh, right, so you, you're waiting for a friend at the airport, uh, you're waiting for someone uh, for, to go for dinner, you're at a movie, you're waiting for a couple of friends to join you. All these questions, you've got a meeting with colleagues, all these uh, scenarios actually include uh, those types of uh, very basic questions. Where are you at this point in time? And so uh, we thought that this would be very interesting to look at, but we wanted to also look at this from a slightly different perspective than the one that Foursquare has taken, trying to capture this broader range of scenarios and trying to do so through a mechanism whereby people would be able to specify preferences that they might have under routine scenarios. Essentially trying to see to what extent we can capture the conditions under which they might be willing to share the location with different groups of people and see to what extent we can do a good job at that. Right? And so you've got actually, besides Foursquare, a number of applications out there that have tried to do the same thing. You might have heard, for instance, of uh, Google Latitude, right? So how many of you have heard of Google Latitude? Right? So some, some number of you have heard it. Uh, no, how many of you use Google Latitude on a regular basis? Right, very good. So you're confirming uh, some of the results I will show you later. So we saw perhaps 10 hands get up, but I think I only saw two hands get up when I asked how many of you are active uh, Google users. And that's something that you see. Looped is another example of a system uh, that has been built in that space. In fact, at some point, we uh, put together an inventory of all these applications, and we uh, recorded over 120 of them. Uh, and uh, none of those, as it turns out, has been very successful. And so it uh, sort of begs the question of why, right? Why is it that none of these applications has been that successful? And so we've tried with our own application. Its most uh, recent incarnation is called Locacino. It's available at locacino.org, and you're welcome to download it if you, this is something that you want to play with. It's actually been downloaded by uh, a meaningful number of people, about 30,000 uh, today, a bit more than that. Not all these users are active users, so we're not like Foursquare. We're happy to actually admit that. Uh, in 130 countries, and uh, this application, as it turns out, departs from others in, in a, a couple of different ways that I'll uh, try to illustrate uh, as we go through this presentation, including the ability to specify more, pr uh, more, um, more detailed, uh, more expressive types of uh, privacy rules. A very common privacy rule, as it turns out, is, uh, which is very natural, and I'm sure many of you will uh, be able to relate to it, is of the type, I'm willing to let my colleagues see my location, but only during weekdays, 9 to 5, and only when I'm on company premises, replace company by CMU campus, and you'll be able to relate to that. Right. As it turns out, uh, Google Latitude, to take something that you seem to be uh, familiar with, Google Latitude does not allow you to specify that. Now, you could, if you were very courageous, you could toggle on and off all your right friends at the right time to effectively enforce that, but that's not going to scale up very well. Right. So you could potentially do this for a few friends. If you've got, you know, think about the number of friends that people have on Facebook, like hundreds of friends, going to be doing that for uh, you know, hundreds of colleagues, that's going to be extremely painful. And so these are the kinds of things that we've tried to essentially address uh, and play with. Auditing functionality. So this is something that we're going to look at also in more detail. The ability to review who's been looking for your location and perhaps on that basis refine your preferences. And also new types of technologies. So I'll be speaking a bit about 
uh, various kinds of learning technology that we've been developing in this context, context that also seem to be uh, making a difference. And so what I'd like to present uh, today are different sets of results. So these are examples of different screenshots. This app runs on laptops, but also on cell phones. You probably saw uh, that we had the uh, Android Marketplace, uh, the App Store, and so on. And so these are the kinds of screens that we can see. You can see the location of your friends. Some of your friends might be willing to disclose their locations, others may not. You can do this from cell phones. You can review the rules that you specified. And so there's a way to look actually at uh, fairly compact natural language representation of the rules that you've defined uh, and somewhat readable uh, versions, obviously. Uh, but you can also go deeper and you can start specifying rules in the form of here are the friends that this rule relates to, here are the times when they can actually see my location, and here are potentially some additional uh, location restrictions of the type, for instance, only when I'm on CMU's campus. Right? And so you can specify those by essentially drawing rectangles on a map and saying uh, it's only within this part of area that this rule is going to apply. So only when I'm within this area can I be seen. And then auditing interfaces and all sorts of things of that nature. Now, let's sort of uh, quickly um, look at the source of uh, data that you quickly get when you start deploying these applications. So we've been deploying these things for a few years now, collected uh, quite a bit of information. And this is a typical example of what you see when you deploy this kind of application. Uh, this is an example of 30 different users. Each user is represented by a square here. Green means share, and red means do not share. Along the horizontal axis here, you've got the seven days of the week. And along the vertical axis here, you've got the 24 hours of the day. And you can see that, obviously, there are some people who are fairly conservative. And as far as they're concerned, it's like, I'm not interested in sharing my location. End of the story. We've got some people who are fairly open, right, who are completely green. There's other people who've got nothing to hide, quote, unquote. And then the majority of the people, so you've got actually three green and three red, which is very interesting. It's actually very typical of what we find. But the majority of the people, we've got 30 people here, 24 out of the 30 are in between. Right. And 24 out of the 30, as you can tell, have actually fairly complex kinds of preferences. This is data collected over several weeks. So we've actually been able to validate that these patterns uh, seem to be uh, recurring. And uh, what you find is that certainly on that basis, uh, it's not the case that privacy doesn't matter. Right? It's not the case that somehow uh, you know, with a very, very simple policy, you'd be able to capture uh, what these, how these people feel about sharing the location uh, with different people. By the way, this is only with regard to sharing with uh, members of the CMU campus community. Right? So as it turns out, if you start looking at sharing with other kinds of people, like close friends and family members, you start looking at sharing with advertisers, you find that uh, there are yet more complex kinds of uh, preferences that come into play. And so the question then is, obviously, if you're a site like uh, you know, Facebook, you may have you know, these very complex set of privacy settings that you're exposing to users. But obviously, uh, the, the secret behind all this is that uh, Facebook makes sure to pick some good privacy settings for you, essentially assuming that by and large you're pretty green rather than being pretty red. And so that might very well work for the three people that we saw on that uh, previous slide that were completely green and some of the ones that tend to be greener than red. But for many other people, somehow, that doesn't work too well. Unfortunately, as we've seen, uh, most people tend not to change their privacy settings, right? So essentially, they will tend to go with the defaults that people have selected for them. That's sort of a recurring theme that you see. And so these default privacy settings tend to have a very major impact on the kinds of behaviors that you're going to see emerging. And to the extent that those privacy settings are slightly aggressive, but not overly aggressive, you will find that users will just go and operate under those settings, sometimes not completely realizing what's going on until it's too late. And, um, and then, obviously, if the settings are too aggressive, then you're going to get a backlash. And occasionally, Facebook users have reacted uh, to some uh, choices made by, uh, by Facebook and required the company to reverse some of the decisions that had made. But by and large, you will find that people have some, some uh, decent tolerance for error, let's say, and are willing to actually live with uh, settings that are sometimes so much more aggressive than what they would have picked on their own. Um, and so we've tried to see what it would take, in effect, uh, within this relatively simple set of scenarios, we're just talking about sharing your location with other people, what would it take to do a better job at capturing people's location sharing privacy preferences? How much more expressive would these settings have to be? And so what we've done here is we've essentially represented uh, the uh, benefits of exposing different sets of settings uh, to users when it comes to sharing the conditions under which they're willing to share their location 
uh, with others. So let me spend a few minutes explaining what we're looking at here. So this is sharing with my friends and uh, my close friends and family members, my Facebook friends, members of the community uh, on campus, and advertisers in, the, in a four square kind of manner, actually. And what we're looking at in different colors here is one, the accuracy that you can expect a user to get if you expose to him just whitelist. A whitelist is essentially uh, a setting where you can say, okay, this particular group of people, they've got the right to see my location all the time. And this particular group of people, they don't have the right to see my location all the time. And when you do that, for instance, for friends and family, if you imagine that friends and family, close friends, um, that means just a small number of people, close friends and family, with whitelist, you actually ac achieve very high accuracy, about 70%. That means 70% of the time, you're actually going to be able to capture what people would like to do. With Facebook friends, on the other hand, you're actually below 30%, right? University community, you get down to about 20%. And advertisers, you're even below that, as it turns out. So clearly, those settings are not sufficient, right? So what happens if you allow people not to qualify these preferences by playing, for instance, with the times of the day? So I might say, 9 to 5, I'm willing to share my location with this group, yes or no? And so when you do that, you get a slight, very, very slight improvement for friends and family. Facebook friends, you get a very minor improvement. University community, same thing. Advertisers, a bit more. So for advertisers, that seems to have a bit more of an impact. Now what happens if you add to this uh, essentially the ability to differentiate not just between the time of the day, but also between weekends and weekdays, right? And so that's what Time Plus shows. Now Time Plus, as you can see, starts getting you some traction. Uh, for instance, here with Facebook friends, that certainly seems to make an impact. Uh, university community also, as well as advertisers, not so much with close friends and family. Then what happens if you just do whitelist and location? Right, so these are the kinds of things that we've been playing with. And you might say, how did you come up with all these results? Well, we spent actually a lot of time collecting data from users. We've had uh, users running around uh, campus and, and beyond for uh, essentially periods of three to four weeks, collecting every single location they go to and asking them to actually indicate who they would be willing to share the location with under different kinds of conditions. Analyzing this data, there's actually a, a set of uh, uh, mechanism design um, techniques that we've developed to analyze this data and come up with the kinds of results that you're seeing here. But that's essentially the crux of what you're seeing. So when you add location, but you remove time, location, as it turns out, is a pretty strong proxy. If you notice, location by itself is actually stronger than weekdays versus weekend. And, and time of the day, as it turns out, for things like advertisers, university community, not so much for Facebook friends. And then obviously the holy grail is to sort of throw everything that you've got, everything in the kitchen sink, right, at, at this problem. So allow people now to specify preferences based on time of the day, day of the week, uh, right, I'm sorry, weekdays versus weekends, the location where you are, right, as well as these groups. And so now you're getting with friends and family, you're getting uh, not too far from 90%, Facebook friends, here you're getting to 60%. Right? So this is significantly higher than what you get with, Facebook, with uh, the whitelist that we start with. Uh, university community, very major uh, jump. Right? You're tripling essentially the accuracy that you have. And so what you're seeing here is in fact that one reason why all these location sharing applications I was referring to earlier, right, the looped and Google latitudes of the world, and there's about 120 of those applications out there today. The reason why they fail to gain traction is essentially that they've not exposed the right settings to users when it comes to specifying their privacy privacy. So this is very interesting because essentially there is this illusion that somehow with Facebook, the success of Facebook suggests that privacy doesn't matter. But here's a different scenario where you focus just on location and you find that unless you expose the right settings to users, you're not going to be very successful. Now you might say, well, accuracy doesn't necessarily mean success. Well, you're right, but let me show you the next result here. Right, so the next result here is looking at this from a slightly different perspective. It says, well, let's not just focus on accuracy. Let's look at the amount of sharing that these different levels of expressiveness give rise to. And sharing, as it turns out, is value by definition. Right, so sharing is what social networking is all about. Right? If you've got no sharing in social networking, you've got no value. So your value is directly related to the amount of sharing that your settings are going to give rise to. And as you can see, the results are very, very similar. Right? So as you can see, essentially, when you add these additional levels of expressiveness in your privacy settings, you're finding that users are going to share a lot more. For instance, with advertisers or Facebook friends, right, 
So if you look at Facebook friends, you're seeing that essentially you're getting twice as much sharing, right, of your location. If you're looking at advertisers, you get about two and a half times uh, the amount of sharing. And so that means quite a bit. And so accuracy does matter because essentially what you find is that when you don't have accuracy, what you do as a user is you're going to end up erring on the safe side. That means you're going to say, well, if I can say yes under these conditions and no under these conditions, by and large, I'm going to say no across the board. I'm going to, be, I'm going to play it safe. And so when you do that, these are the kinds of results that you see. And so in effect, this explains why these, uh, so for instance, I've, uh, we've received funding from, uh, from Google to do this research. And so I have uh, had a chance to interact with uh, the Google Attitude people a few times. And it's very interesting because they talk about their super users. And so the first time I heard that, I thought, hmm, super users, that sounds very impressive. I need to find out more about who these super users are. And so I asked them, what do you really mean by your super users? And they said, well, these are people who've got five friends or more. And I said, aha, that explains everything. That explains exactly what I've seen in these results here. Because obviously super users on Facebook are people who've got hundreds, if not over a thousand friends. Right. The fact that your super users with Google Attitude only have five friends tells me why you know, so few people continue to use Google Attitude. They've not been able to generate value. At the end of the day, the settings are such that they can only share with a very small number of people, and that's not enough for them to build critical mass and to find enough value in continuing to use the application. Right. And so this is sort of a very interesting uh, uh, example of not just why privacy matters, but also why privacy and success of applications like social networking applications don't necessarily have to pull you in different directions. In fact, this suggests that if you can find the right kinds of settings, right, you might actually find that these two things are converging, that you're going to enable people to find the right level of control, the right level of comfort, so that they can actually invite enough people to make these applications valuable. We didn't see this on Facebook as a whole, Although, as we know, location sharing on Facebook is not really terribly, terribly popular just yet. This is not how Facebook became popular. Right? And so it turns out that for some certain things, Facebook has adequate settings. For other things, on the other hand, many of these social applications out there have not gained uh, traction yet, apparently because of lack of, uh, lack of uh, exposing the right types of settings. Now, you might say, hold on a second here. Uh, what kind of story are, are, you, uh, you know, are, are you telling me? because you've completely ignored one thing, and I have, and the thing that I've completely ignored is user burden considerations. So I've assumed extremely smart users, and I've assumed that somehow they would be willing to engage with these settings and essentially configure them optimally, right? And so the results I showed you so far were based on a typical sort of uh, mechanism design view of the world. We're going to assume fairly smart users who ultimately are going to take full advantage of the settings you expose to them. So the question is, well, to what extent do these results still hold when you take into account actual user burden considerations? And so we look at, you know, we have a lot of data because we've actually seen how many rules people are willing to set, right? And, and in fact, the reality is that people are only willing to set a very, very small number of rules on these things. They're going to spend 30 seconds, a minute, perhaps two minutes configuring their rules, and then they're going to move on. And either within those two minutes, they will have generated enough value Right? or they will not, and they'll move on. They won't be using your application. And so this is what happens when you actually reflect that, uh, take that into account in your analysis. So these are the same kinds of results, so the colors mean the same things, but now I've actually imposed a constraint on this analysis. And that constraint is in the number of rules I can expect my users to specify. And so if my users were only specifying one rule, for instance, even under those conditions, I would start seeing benefits Right. And this is one rule across all four of these groups. So I'm basically saying you've got one chance to specify one rule, specify that rule right, across advertisers, university committee, Facebook friends, close friends, and family. Right. And that rule can essentially, in this case here, include a location restriction, a weekend versus weekday restriction, a time of the day restriction, right. and one or more of these groups. So you might, for instance, say, I'm willing to share my location with uh, close friends and family, and uh, you know maybe my Facebook friends, but only weekdays, 9 to 5, again, maybe when I'm on CMU, CMU's campus. Everything else I'm going to be saying no to. Or, uh, you know, so those are the kinds of rules. When I've got two rules, then I might actually be able to refine things. I might be able to split, for instance, advertisers, 
and uh, CMU community. If I've got three wolves, I might be able to refine things further. And so what you're seeing here is that even with those kinds of constraints, very quickly, and most of our Locatino users will tend to specify two to three rules on average. Some of them specify more, some of them specify less. And certainly when you get to two or three rules, right, you're starting to actually see a lot of value already with this increase in expressiveness. Here is uh, another view of this where the restriction now is no longer applied across all these four groups, but just on Facebook friends, which is sort of fairly representative of what you would want to do. So let's say that Facebook were to expose tomorrow these settings where you can qualify the conditions under which you're willing to share your location with others, subject to time of the day, weekend versus weekday and location. And let's say that users are willing to specify three rules, as we've observed in many cases. That's the increase that you would see, right, in terms of uh, accuracy and, as we know, also in terms of sharing. So you would get a lot more value. So this is one example why essentially this part of space, when it comes to sharing location, we've not seen tremendous success. The exception being Foursquare, but Foursquare, as I pointed out earlier, is essentially a very limited set of scenarios where you explicitly check in, so you're basically no longer relying on these rules that are supposed to capture your routine scenarios. You explicitly go out and say, yes, I'm willing to let the world know that I'm here. And so those scenarios exist, but this is not terribly scalable. Right? So for instance, the scenario where I want to find out whether or not my wife stopped by at, uh, you know, at, uh, to pick up my, my uh, kids in time at school, I'm not going to be relying on her using Foursquare to let me know while she's driving that you know, she's at actually right now at this particular location, which may not be the school yet. Right? So that's clearly not going to work. That's only going to work under a very small set of scenarios. If you want to go beyond these scenarios, it seems that you need to have more expressive kinds of rules. And so the question then is, well, what is it going to take to leverage this kind of expressiveness? Because if these rules in practice are this much compl this complex, uh, then somehow we're going to have to engage users, right, and see whether we can get them to actually spend a couple of minutes configuring these rules. If you don't really go beyond what is being done today, you're not going to get there. We know that most Facebook users never tweak their settings, right? 80% of Facebook users, as far as I know, never go and change anything or perhaps change one setting or two, and that's pretty much it. So what is it going to take to go beyond that? And so these are the kinds of questions that we've been asking. How can we help users make the most out of the settings they're going to be given, right? So let's say that we make these settings more expressive, right? And Facebook clearly doesn't do that. Facebook basically brags that it offers all these settings, and therefore the world should be happy, because in theory they could go ahead and tweak those things. In practice, they don't. So what would it take to get users to have actually, to actually engage these set with these settings, to actually go ahead and configure these settings in a way that better captures their preferences in scenarios that matters? And so one thing that you could ask is you could say, well, expressiveness is great, but it doesn't necessarily mean huge user burden. Perhaps we can find uh, good default policies that may potentially take advantage of a fairly expressive underlying framework. Right. Perhaps everyone has this privacy preference that I was referring to. Perhaps everyone feels that they would be willing to share with others on campus their location, nine to five weekdays when on, on CMU's campus. Maybe that's a great default policy. Maybe we could have this for everyone. And even though it's much more expressive, if everyone feels the same way, user burden is minimal. And so we could actually reconcile potential user burden and expressiveness all at once. Well, the sad story is, as I've shown you earlier, that things are not that simple, right? It's pretty difficult, in fact, to come up with a good default policy when you've got users who are this diverse, right? How do you find a good default between this guy and that guy? Anyone has any idea? Well, Facebook believes that this is the default, right? And anyone in this room who deals with security knows that the right approach is to actually go red. Neither one of those two approaches works very well, right? I mean, here you're going to be validating the privacy of many of your users. Right? And in this case, you're going to have no sharing, therefore no value, therefore Facebook disappears. Right? So neither one of those scenarios is going to be working out for us. We need to go beyond that. And so one of the interesting things that we've noticed over time is that it is actually possible to develop user-oriented machine learning techniques that will help us identify interesting default privacy personas, as we call them. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all policy is going to work for everyone. But as it turns out, if you restrict yourself to understandable policies, right, don't try to come up with your default clustering technique, 
uh, that's going to come up with like four profiles that will each one of them look like something like this. And then present this to users and say, who are you? Are you this guy, that guy, or that guy? Nobody's ever going to be able to figure this out, right? So don't expect people to configure things with those kinds of profiles. You need to somehow move away from traditional machine learning towards techniques that emphasize also understandability and simplicity in many ways. And so when you do that, as it turns out, you can still get somewhere. And the key to do getting somewhere uh, is to essentially say, hold on a sec. Yes, these users look very different. But actually, if I strain my eyes a little bit and I stare at this a bit longer, I might actually start seeing some patterns. Like weekends versus weekdays certainly seems to be making a difference. Day one being obviously Sunday and day six, uh, seven, I'm sorry, being Saturday in this example. If I look more carefully, I'm seeing some interesting horizontal lines here. Right? So maybe there's something going on there. Perhaps this is lunchtime. And yes, lunchtime may not be the same thing as at the same time for everyone. You all had lunch before my talk. I will have lunch after my talk. Right? So our lunchtime may not coincide, but we all have something called lunchtime. Right? And so no, perhaps what I can do is I can essentially move towards what we call canonical concepts and see whether by projecting all these very diverse preferences onto canonical concepts, we cannot come up, in fact, with simpler privacy preferences where essentially your lunchtime will just be a parameter. But we're going to recognize that perhaps a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people, an interesting cluster of people, will actually have preferences that tie to their lunchtime or that tie to whether or not they're at home or at work. And even though you know home for you might be different from home for me, work might be different. In fact, if we can somehow project these preferences into these canonical concepts, we might actually get somewhere. And the answer is actually we can. So without, again, uh, bothering you with a lot of technical details, when you do that and, and you obviously try different things, you can actually get somewhere interesting. So these are essentially results going back to those groups that we've looked at. Uh, family, close friends, so it's a slightly different group, university, and anyone. And looking at how much accuracy you can get, or accuracy loss in this case, you get from essentially forcing people to essentially uh, pick one out of a small set of default privacy personas. Think of them as being a small number of rules that it will say, oh, that's really me. I'm going to pick that. And making these personas very simple. So we're actually imposing some understandability constraints <coughs> in a way in which we're essentially coming up with these uh, clusters, if you want. And so what you find is that if you're only exposing one privacy persona to people, and it comes to forcing them to essentially pick that persona for members of their family, that's only going to go so well. You're going to get a, about a 15% accuracy uh, loss. If you offer them two personas on your hand, you're getting very, very close to 5% loss. That's pretty good, 95% accuracy. That's not bad. Essentially, what that means is that, by and large, people in your family will fall into two ca categories. One group, probably, that you'll be willing to share with all the time, and one group that you might be a bit more cautious about. You can sort of imagine who these groups might be. Right? Close friends, here it's a bit different. Actually, you need to go up to three to get somewhere meaningful. But at three, as it turns out, you're getting below 5% in accuracy loss. University members of the university committee, that's a bit more diverse. So here it seems that you need to go a bit farther, and it seems that even you know between three and four we don't seem to be getting much of a difference. And anyone, as it turns out, well, who wants to share an awful lot with anyone? There are occasionally some random people who don't fit within these categories that you're willing to share with. And so if you get essentially that second rule, that second cluster, I'm sorry, you're going to get somewhere, but beyond that you don't get much much traction. So it seems that perhaps default policies can, or at least in the form of default personas, where you're not forcing people to pick one, you're forcing them to pick between a small set of choices, right? Are you this kind of person? Or are you this kind of person? Small set of clusters, if you want. Clusters that are easy to understand. You can actually do pretty well, uh, and you can do a fairly good job at leveraging this additional expressiveness that I was talking about. But this is clearly not everything. And so we've been looking at other ways of getting traction in this space. So one question that uh, we explored at some point was, well, perhaps we have actually uh, privacy preferences that are tied to the nature of different locations. So for instance, I was talking about home and work. Home and work are very different in many ways. Home is a much more private place. Work tends to be a somewhat more public place. And so it's not by surprise that if you look, for instance, at Foursquare and the locations where people check in, typically don't check in at their home, right? Do you find they check in at more public types of places? where their privacy preferences are much more open, if you want. 
And so we've come up with this notion of location entropy that looks at the diversity of people who visit a location over time. And it seems to be very interestingly correlated with, in fact, the willingness that people have to share that location with others. So that's yet another example in which one might be able to come up with interesting default profiles that will essentially reduce user burden, yet capture uh, essentially some of the complex elements that people have when it comes to their privacy preferences, when it comes to sharing some of these sensitive uh, contextual attributes such as uh, location. Now, all this is very nice, but clearly we're not at 100% accuracy, far from that, right? And so the next question is, can we somehow go beyond this, right? What are the kinds of things that we could do to help users uh, further tweak their preferences? And so we've looked at a number of different techniques, starting with some fairly mundane ones, and then moving on again to uh, see whether we could potentially learn, uh, leverage some machine learning techniques as well. So the mundane ones include essentially things such as, well, can we do a better job at helping people better understand what their privacy preferences are in the first place? A big reason why people have a hard time configuring privacy preferences has to do with the fact that they don't necessarily know how they feel about these scenarios. They don't necessarily know who they feel comfortable sharing with and who they don't, in part because they don't know what will happen when they make their location available to different people. Perhaps this guy will be checking my location every five minutes if I give him the right to. And that's going to be feeling pretty wrong, and I will want to be able to change that. Or perhaps these people will be very reasonable. But, but you don't necessarily know up front. And so what we found is that typically people will tend to start with relatively conservative policies. But if you give them a chance to actually observe what's going on, they might be willing to relax these policies in a selective fashion over time. And so the way in which you can promote that, as it turns out, is by giving people additional functionality, functionality that will enable them to better understand the envelope of behaviors that's entailed by the privacy preference that I've specified. Essentially, I've specified these rules. How are people responding to this? Are they checking my location every two minutes? Or are they just checking under you know, fairly reasonable conditions? Like, you know, this person is supposed to meet with me in five minutes. And yes, I was, you know, uh, he was concerned that I might be late, so he checked my location. Very reasonable. I'm happy that he was able to do that. Right. And so how do you do this? Well, essentially, we build a number of different variations of, of this kind of functionality. Uh, this is actually an early version. So this is going back to 2006, 2007. Essentially, you can review everyone who's been looking for your location. You can see how your rules process that request, whether or not uh, that person was able to see your location. But you can also ask questions and dig deeper. So you might say, well, why is it, for instance, uh, that this person was or was not able to see my location. Well, in this case, for instance, you've got a simple explanation that says, your location was disclosed because of the rule my colleagues can see me during our uh, work hours, right? And then uh, essentially on that basis, if you're not happy, you can go and change that, that corresponding rule or you can potentially add an extra rule. So the question is, how do people respond to this? Well, here are a couple of interesting results. Uh, and let me explain what we're looking at here on this chart. So this is uh, based on a pilot that we ran, I think it was back in 2008, uh, where we had about 56 uh, people that were uh, split into two categories or two conditions. One group of people had the right to review who had been looking for the location and one didn't. Otherwise, the two groups were identical. They had the same location sharing application uh, that was interfacing uh, through Facebook. And we looked uh, at how they felt bo both before and after running the pilot. That pilot lasted a month. And we asked them how they felt about sharing the location with different groups of people, from strangers to acquaintances to friends, et cetera. And what you see here is you see responses from the two groups. NF means no feedback or no auditing functionality. And F means with feedback or with auditing functionality, the ability to review who's been looking for a location. And what you find is that, by and large, these people were in the same place when they started. But after uh, the pilot, those people who had the feedback uh, functionality available actually felt fairly differently. So for instance, when it came to sharing the location, it's not like they wanted to share with everyone. This is a Likert scale, here being very comfortable, here being fairly uncomfortable. It's not like they became extremely comfortable sharing with strangers, but most of them noticed that nothing terribly bad happened. And so they started feeling a bit more comfortable sharing with at least some strangers. Uh, with friends, obviously, you find that people are generally much more comfortable, but you see there's hardly any change in a condition that had no feedback or no auditing functionality, where you see a meaningful jump in a condition that actually had that auditing functionality. Now, a more interesting way of looking at this is to actually see uh, the policies that people 
uh, created or had created by the end of the pilot. And so here we're looking at the users who are in the condition with the auditing interface, and here you've got the users with, in the condition with no auditing interface. And these are the, the rules that they had specified by the end of the pilot, after using this application for four weeks. These guys were essentially identical when they started in terms of willingness to share. But by the end of the pilot, the group that had actually the ability to review who was looking for their location was actually doing a lot more sharing than the other group. So what happened? Well, what happened, again, is that this group had the ability to review who was looking for them, had the ability to develop a finer sense for the conditions under which they were willing to share, and to go and tweak these rules, selectively opening them up, so that the people they felt comfortable sharing with, but that originally they would have denied access to their location to, uh, would have the ability to now see their location. Right. And so here's just another um, visualization of that. This is an earlier pilot that we ran, small number of users. What we're looking at here is we're looking at essentially the rules that uh, these 12 different users had specified, and we reprocessed every single request that had been submitted for each one of these individuals during the course of the pilot, looking at how their rules as defined originally at the start of the pilot would have processed that request, and how their rules as defined at the end of the pilot would have processed that request. And what we're seeing is that many of these requests are actually processed in an identical manner, but there are some differences. And the differences are represented with these two different uh, colors here. This color here represents essentially a situation where a particular request would originally have been denied, but by the end of the pilot, the user's rules would actually have allowed it. And this is the opposite. Right? And what you see is that for many users, there are many, many more requests that are actually granted with the rules that they have at the end than would have been granted at the start of the pilot. So 10 of those 12 users, there are exceptions. Right? This guy, for instance, something fairly different happened here. So he might have seen something he didn't like, tighten his or her rules. But 10 out of these 12 users actually decided that it would selectively relax their preferences. And so what that means is that essentially things that are as simple as enabling people, for instance, to review who's looking for them, getting people an opportunity to get a better sense for how their rules are behaving, what kinds of behaviors they give rise to, will enable them to essentially reach a level of comfort that they would not be able to reach otherwise, and seems to also, on average, obviously there might be bad scenarios, but seems to, on average, also lead to more sharing which again goes back to this theme where somehow privacy and social networking don't necessarily have to be irreconcilable. It seems that if you configure these things right, you might actually get these things to converge, right? Now, it's interesting to reflect on what's happening in this space today, right? So uh, I don't know how many of you are Android users, but if you are, you've noticed that every time you download an app, for instance, from the market, uh, from the Android market, you're going to get prompted with something that looks like this. That includes your location. It's going to say, are you willing to share your location with this application? And what do most people do? Most people say yes, right? Because you're essentially at this part of the point in time where you're really eager to see this application, and you're not terribly concerned about your privacy. And so you're going to say yes up front. You're never going to, going to be prompted again for that, with that question. Right? So you will say one. Yes, once at a time when you're most prone to saying yes, because as uh, uh, people like my colleague Alessandro Acquisti have shown, uh, people tend to heavily discount long-term effects and privilege short-term rewards. At this point in time, the reward is to get the application to work, and the long-term effects seem very nebulous, such as whatever long-term privacy impact there might be. And so people will tend to click yes, and they'll have to go and live with that. Uh, Apple does a slightly better job so Apple actually allows you to uh, toggle these things on and off. And it actually even gives you the ability to see which app has potentially access to your location over the past 24 hours. But this is still very coarse, right? It's not the level of uh, auditing that we've been talking about. So it's slightly better. But you know, when you see that you've shared your location with someone over the past 24 hours, that may be 24 hours too late. Right, and so there's still, I think this is still very questionable. So the kinds of things that we're talking about here are things that certainly you're not seeing today yet, but that could clearly, based on our results, uh, make a difference in the future. And we're strongly suggesting to industry that this is something they should do. In fact, with Locacino, we're going beyond that. So for instance, with Locacino, you have the ability today to say, well, show me all the friends who can locate me right now based on my rules. 
and all the people who cannot locate me right now. And you can also, in fact, not just look at who's been looking for your location, like the real request, and whether or not they were allowed or denied, but you can also see, for instance, what if requests. So this is, again, to accelerate that process, to give you a better understanding of what your rules would permit today and what they would not permit. So rather than just restricting you to seeing what actually happened, let's try to anticipate problems ahead of time and give you a chance to refine your rules before it's too late. Right? And so these what if queries also seem to be making a difference, although we need to evaluate this uh, further. But these are examples of the kinds of things that, that you can do. And this is also working on uh, cell phones. So to go back to uh, my earlier question, can machine learning potentially further help? One of the things that we've seen is that when you expose these kinds of auditing interfaces to users, they're actually very often willing to give you feedback. They're willing to, not necessarily on every single request, but they're often willing, just like they do on Netflix, to tell you whether or not they were happy seeing a movie. They might be willing to tell you whether or not they're happy that their location was made available or not in response to a given request. And so the question is, could machine learning help us guide users towards preferences that better capture the way they feel? And we've known for many years, so these are actually very old results that I like to show. It's going back, I think, to 2004. We've known for many years that, in fact, machine learning can do much better than human uh, users, right? And so you're not necessarily supposed to understand what each one of these colors mean. You're just supposed to know that under, for each one of these users, the bar that shoots the highest in terms of accuracy is the one with machine learning. The problem with machine learning is that it's traditionally been deployed as a black box kind of technology, where essentially machine learning takes over and it says, you know, step aside user, let me figure out what you want and decide for you, right? And the day that happens, you've lost control, right? And so, for instance, if you're interested in sharing your location with your girlfriend and two weeks later you break up with that girlfriend, machine learning will be in control at that point in time. It will have come up with this fancy decision tree that you as a poor user will never be able to understand. And to take it another two weeks of feedback from you saying, I really don't want my old girlfriend to be able to see my location anymore. And after two weeks, you might learn that. Uh, but if somehow you had been able to actually still relate to that model that had been learned, then in fact, you would have been able to go in there right away, tweak these preferences, you know, up front, rather than have to wait two weeks for machine learning to figure this out on your behalf, right? And so essentially, when it comes to these kinds of scenarios, and privacy is a good example of this, security would be another one, you really want the user to remain in control. You really want somehow to constrain machine learning to a very different way of interacting with users. One where, one, the user continues to understand what the underlying model is so that he or she still has the ability to go and directly manipulate that model if for some reason the user sees something he doesn't like, whether it's just because machine learning is not getting this right or because the conditions have changed, right? As in the example where you break up with your girlfriend. And so if you want to move towards those kinds of scenarios, you need to really uh, revisit how machine learning works, as it turns out. Because machine learning traditionally has been entirely about accuracy. Right? So I've got all these data points, and I'm going to try to come up with the best possible fit. That's by and large, and I'm obviously simplifying a little bit, but that's by and large what machine learning does. And so what we've tried to do instead is we've tried towards, to move towards models that try to reconcile convergence or accuracy, if you want, with considerations of understandability, which includes things such as how complex is this policy, and also how far does it deviate from the policy that the user originally defined. Because if you want the user to be able to continue relating to that policy, you've got to recognize that users will most likely only feel comfortable with fairly incremental changes to their policies. And so those are the kinds of things that we've done. So this is illustrated in this example here. We've got a user who's got uh, some sharing going on with different friends colleagues, spouse, and, and some friends. And as you can see here, you've got your typical preferences, willing to share during weekdays, 9 to 5, or whatever the time is, with the spouse and with some friends Friday night and on Saturday or something like that. And now you've got all these feedback points that the user has been willing to audit. And on that basis, you can essentially see whether or not you could potentially define rules that will do a better job at capturing the user's preferences. And so the idea is that you're going to try to do this incrementally. Obviously, this is a Mickey Mouse example. Right? And so don't expect machine learning to be able to operate on three data points like that, uh, or you're going to be extremely inaccurate. But that's essentially what we're aiming for with these kinds of technologies. And so essentially, there's a whole formalism that has been developed. I'm going to spare you the details, where we're essentially trying to move away from traditional machine learning and move towards what we call user understandable or user controllable policy learning. 
And here, you're looking also at notions of accuracy and distance from the current policy as you weigh your different options. And so one way of doing that is to essentially support neighborhood search, where you take the user's current policy and you start exploring neighborhoods of that policy, essentially ways of slightly modifying rules that the user has defined, adding a friend to a group, removing a friend from a group, splitting a time interval, extending a time interval, adding a location. Those are the kinds of things that you want to do. And when you do that, it turns out that you can actually converge fairly fast. Right? So those are examples of convergence curves that we've seen. And so time is short. And so um, essentially, I'd like to go back and essentially revisit uh, the theme of, of, of this presentation. So I asked initially, can somehow privacy and social networking be reconciled? I believe that uh, it's been a mistake to somehow assume that these things will necessarily be pulling you in different directions. I don't think that any of the applications out there today have done a very good job at reconciling that. But what's interesting and what our research suggests is that, in fact, in situations where that has not been properly reconciled, in fact, there's been a backlash and a lack of adoption. Those location sharing applications, like Google Latitude, being a prime example of that. And Foursquare really only deals with a very narrow set of scenarios. The success of Foursquare doesn't change any of the results that I've presented here today. And so really, if you want to move towards, essentially, a view that says, well, it's not about you know, a competition between these two things. It's really more about trying to see to what extent we can get them to converge in some manner. So what are the ways in which we're going to get there? Well, our results certainly suggest that this is not a trivial proposition. Right? It suggests that you need to develop uh, much finer uh, analysis techniques to identify, for instance, what are the levels of expressiveness that you expose to users. I've glossed over many of the details of the technologies that we've developed to do the game, uh, the mechanism uh, design uh, work that I presented early in this presentation. Uh, that's far from trivial, but it can certainly be done. It can certainly help you converge towards combinations of settings that will do a much better job at capturing how people really feel about these scenarios. And then ultimately, it's about leveraging that further by reconciling that with user burden considerations, right? So as I said, Facebook users essentially find themselves often stuck with default settings because A, they don't necessarily understand what these settings mean, B, they don't necessarily have the time, not necessarily willing to invest the effort required to tweak these things. So certainly, it seems based on our research in the context of location, that there are a number of examples where you might be able to get some good amount of traction by presenting users with a small number of personas. Don't assume it's one size fits all. How do you do that? Again, move away from traditional machine learning try to inject a human understandable element in these techniques. And I didn't really detail how this is done, but it can be done. We've got some publication on that. Auditing makes a big difference, as we've seen. And then ultimately, dialogues and suggestions. That seems to be making a big difference, too. So what kind of research are we doing in this space today beyond these results? Well, we're still experimenting with different combinations of these techniques that I've presented. Uh, if I had had more time, I would have actually presented examples of results where we're actually combining, for instance, default policies and user controllable policy learning, but I don't think I've got the time to do that. Beyond that, an interesting question remains, to what extent users will pick the right settings for themselves? Uh, this is going back to this issue of users tending to somehow privilege short-term rewards over long-term consequences. And so one of the things that we've been experimenting with is to see to what extent we can potentially also, through default policies and through suggestions, influence users to adopt practices that are going to be safer for them. Now, you might say, who are you to claim that you know how users should be behaving? And that's a very good point. Well, one way of trying to do that objectively is to take a look at users who've been using, for instance, Facebook for a couple of years and have essentially gained from perhaps past mistakes a better understanding of how they'd like to use the system. And use those uh, users, essentially, when you've got a new user coming in, to see essentially if you can identify clusters of like-minded users who've been on the system or on the, uh, within the environment for a couple of years and use these people's preferences as a guide for suggestions that you might want to make to the new users. Essentially, the goal here is to minimize long-term regret. Think about the guy who posts this really embarrassing picture on Facebook, and it's more than one guy, as we know. Uh, that guy might have been very happy posting that picture at the time he did. However, two years later, he realized this was probably a very big mistake. And so he might have really liked to have, you know, to be able to benefit from the wisdom of people who had made that mistake earlier by essentially being given suggestions that would have been in line with what you learned from making those mistakes. 
right? And so we've been doing a, a number of other things. So you might also say, well, to what extent is it the case that what you're seeing here is dependent on you know, our population here on campus at CMU or here in the US? And so we've actually been doing some uh, work also uh, conducting similar studies elsewhere. I don't have the time to talk about that. We've got actually a paper that will come out uh, in the next few weeks that compares uh, results uh, from a, a study conducted here on CMU's campus and at Beihang University in, in China, where we essentially looked at people for a period of several weeks, looked at how they felt about sharing location with different groups. And there are some very interesting differences, but certainly one thing that's common across these scenarios is to find that people have, we consistently find that people have fairly sophisticated privacy preferences. These preferences are diverse and these preferences are complex. And so the kinds of techniques that are presented seem like they would be useful across cultures, as far as we can tell. So I'm going to have to stop here. I think I've exceeded my time. Uh, and uh, obviously, perhaps as a final note, right? so this was just about location. Think about the, the environment, the, the, the world that we're moving towards. right? It's all about social networking, context awareness, uh, lots and lots of information, pervasive computing. Uh, you're interacting with a variety of different services. So if it's already tough to do this for location, what is it going to take to do this across a much wider range of uh, contextual attributes? And the answer is, it's probably going to take something much more sophisticated than what I've presented today. I'd like to think of the techniques we've developed so far as being essentially early precursors from what will eventually be what we call a privacy uh, agent, some kind of functionality that's going to be more advanced than what I present today, but that will be able to interact with you, having occasionally a dialogue of some kind, saying, well, by the way, you know, you've interacted with 100 services. I've got a pretty good understanding of how you feel giving information to these different services. But no, you've got this you know, other one that's a bit different. And I'd like to confirm that it's OK to share this information with that particular service. And so selectively deciding when to ask an extra question, being able to interpret that question, being able to generalize from that question, those are the kinds of things that ultimately we'd like to do, as well as providing suggestions that are going to make you safer so that you avoid making the, the mistakes that uh, uh, these people who posted embarrassing pictures on Facebook made. So that's the end of my talk. Any questions? Yes? Uh, when you make this audit information available, you're not only affecting the privacy of the user whose account it is, but also who accesses that information. That's right. Do you find it changes the behavior of those people accessing the information? Well, uh, uh, my suspicion is it, it does, but I've not actually tried to measure that. But you would think that accountability is not a bad thing to do. You would think that if the person requesting your information knows that you'd be able to access that, he's going to show a bit more restraint. He's not going to be stalking you. And that seems to be beneficial, right, I would think. But we've not actually been able to measure that. We've not had the time to actually measure that. That's a good question. Yes? You've uh, talked about, uh, started with the obvious ideas about uh, improving the functionality of expressing improves the chances of getting uh, accurate expressions of their intent. Uh, slightly less obvious ideas about auditing and machine uh, learning techniques and so on. The premise appears to be that the definition of success is 100% accuracy of expressing the user's intent. However, uh, the service provided the definition of success is hoisting upon the user the maximum amount of uh, uh, information sharing that they will put up with. So, so I don't think that success... Less than most agree, but right. So success is not 100% by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's very clear that, you know, you've got adopters of, of these solutions. Even Google Latitude has some users, right? And clearly they don't have 100% accuracy. What people tend to do is they tend to err on the safe side. And uh, those of, among them who can uh, create enough value while being careful, or those of them who perhaps have fairly lax privacy preferences, will be able to create value faster than others, right? So there's clearly a very diverse population. You don't need 100% accuracy, right? Essentially what people will do when they don't have 100% accuracy is they'll say, well, I'll just say no under those scenarios where I can't quite specify what I want. And what that means is that you could very well have adoption at 60% potentially, right? There is some tolerance for error. Oh, I don't know, it's too complicated, whatever. Right. And they go along, and that's why we have Facebook has lots of embarrassing things. So you've got a combination of these things, right? So you, it's obviously more complex than just, you know, people systematically being, being, uh, being careful. There are some people who will be tricked 
you know, or perhaps will be lazy or will, will not be careful enough and will not notice that their default settings under which they're operating are doing things that are not completely consistent with their expectations. But essentially the point I'm trying to make is you don't need 100% accuracy to have adoption, right? But certainly higher accuracy is going to help adoption, right? And certainly when it comes to location sharing, for instance, uh, there seems to be a lot of evidence that the fact that accuracy was too low resulted in too little sharing, too little value, and it seems to explain the, the lack of adoption of these applications today. But you don't need to have 100% to have adoption. Does that answer your question? Not really. I think I agree with what you just said. But right. The idea is that, uh, what I'm, I'm getting to say clearly enough, there is a uh, disconnect between the incentive for the service provider and the individual wants to have their intentions, intentions expressed completely accurately by definition. The service provider, on the other hand, wants to maximize uh, uh, the adoption and participation and sharing and the creation of value. Absolutely. And the creation of value is dependent on information being, the maximum amount of valuable information being shared. That's right. And those are yes. not necessarily and it's, it's not fully aligned. largely no. completely disconnected. It, it, it's, uh, it seems to be very disconnected, and certainly, you know, I started my talk by saying there's this perception that it's completely disconnected. I think that it's not fully disconnected, but I agree with you that it is not perfectly aligned either. So clearly as a provider, and Facebook has done that, right, you will try to see what you can get away with. Right? You will try to take advantage of the fact that perhaps you can push that the aggressive defaults on people, and they'll go along with that without changing them. As long as it doesn't bother them too much, you might actually be able to extract more sharing than what people would do if they had 100% accuracy or some higher, higher level of accuracy. It's clear that the providers will do that, right? I completely agree with you. Uh, but our results, on the other hand, suggest that if you go too far, right, you will not necessarily be successful. And so I view that as a positive. You know, is the glass half empty or half full? That's you know, for each one of us to decide. I'm sort of arguing that perhaps it's half full. Other questions? Yes? So uh, you had a lot of data, and I was very impressed by that. But for some of the uh, policies that users selected, for example, uh, where you used red and green to show when people desired for their information to share, um, you, you didn't necessarily have a, a measure of how well those policies correlated with what that user thought they were doing. Know, at the time when they set it up, so I, I, I'm inclined to think that you know somebody who says all red or all green maybe didn't know what they were doing when they manipulated the settings. Do, are you also you know trying so, to go in that direction to, to maybe give a, a qualitative yes. measure to? So I've shown you a lot of different uh, results as you pointed out, and I've sort of not necessarily gone into a lot of details about how you know these different results differed from one another in the way in which data was collected. As it turns out, the chart that you're referring to was uh, collected through a uh, fairly comprehensive study where we followed people for three weeks, tracked every single location they went to, and paid them money to actually report how they felt in terms of sharing that location with different people. And so, in effect, we bypassed the issue of whether or not they had the right settings uh, and sort of uh, validated uh, consistency also of the answers they provided over multiple weeks. Uh, with fairly small standard deviations, as it turns out. Yes? Uh, it seems that for a lot of these services, um, they're not really offering the user a whole lot of value to share their location. So uh, part of the problem might be that they don't have the right uh, settings for people to actually adopt those services, but part of it is that there's not really enough value. So for something like Facebook, I can maybe learn about my friend's interests and so on, and I would be happy to share my own interests or photos. But for something like location, I might not see a whole lot of value in terms of knowing everybody's location at all times. Right. And it's certainly not worth the amount of information that I have to disclose um, to know where everybody else is, for example. Right. So what are your thoughts about that? So what you're saying is you're saying it's possible that even with 100% accuracy, this would still not be valuable. That's uh, possible. Uh, but uh, somehow that seems to be, uh, so certainly you could argue that perhaps Foursquare has already demonstrated that some people are willing to go along with those scenarios, but that's not a massive number of people. Uh, and so 
the other uh, viewpoint that I would bring, you know, uh, as part of this answer is that you look at, you know, phone calls, look at your own phone calls, and see how many times people are calling you and asking you where you are, right? And there's a good number of those phone calls that you get probably every day or at least every week that actually have to do with that. So that need to know where people are seems to be there. Uh, you know, how you respond to that answer, as it turns out, I didn't get to go uh, into those kinds of details. It's not necessarily with a dot on a map and your latitude and longitude. So often, your answer might actually be fairly vague. It might be, I'm at Starbucks, without saying which Starbucks, or I'm working, which is not even an answer about your location, but more about your activity. And so uh, another line of research that we've pursued, I didn't have a chance to uh, present those results, has been to see to what extent we can go beyond this disclosed versus not disclosed uh, view of the world when it comes to location and see if we can rely on different ways of modulating your answer. Uh, Google Latitude, by the way, offers that. So we've got actually results where we've been evaluating the benefit of obfuscating the, the level of accuracy in your location. But we've also looked at different ways that people use to refer to their location, whether as a street address, name of a business, or some other canonical, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, terminology. And we've been able to actually predict with about 80% accuracy which one of a set of four different methodologies people have when they refer to the location based on attributes such as who is requesting, what your social relationship is, how distant you are from them at a particular point in time when they submit, their they submit their request and so on. And so those kinds of scenarios, uh, you know, show also that these, these things are actually more complex than what I've actually described uh, today. And so, to go back to, to your answer, I suspect there is, there is a value and you could sort of, uh, you know, come up with, you know, application in this area that would gain a fairly broad acceptance. But clearly, from what I've seen, you would need to have these more complex settings. You need to expose these more complex settings to users in some form. Okay, sounds like we're done with questions. Thank you very much.